Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention? I think uh, this session will not lack attention. This is one of the most exciting missions that have happened in the European environment for many, many years. It is, uh, you will hear today about the Rosetta mission, which is presently going on. You probably all heard about the landing of uh, Philae, and uh, the, you've seen some of the pictures that came out of this mission. We have here today the core team that has, uh, has been active in this mission that has really ensured the success that we are now celebrating. We have two people here on the right-hand side. This is uh, Dr. Paolo Ferri. He is the head of mission operations of uh, ESA in Darmstadt at ESOC. And um, he is the leader of the team that did this fantastic um, ride to set off um, the lander at a distance of half a billion kilometers from the Earth with a time delay of about half an hour. And they steered this to an accuracy of 100 meters. So that's the one side. The other side, this is Dr. Stefan Ulametz. Uh, he will report you about Philae itself, about the landing instrument, and uh, will tell you uh, what has been achieved in the 60 hours of operations and what happened in the meantime. Uh, I will not keep you from listening to these excellent present presenters, and we will start off with uh, Paolo. Please, Paolo, you have the floor. Thank you, Matt. So, good evening. I hope my microphone is working. Um, we share the presentation so that you don't get too bored at the end. And uh, I start telling you why we did this mission. We wanted to study comets. And for centuries, millennia, comets have uh, accompanied the history of uh, mankind. And that's the way we were we were seeing them, a stripe in the sky, traveling slowly over weeks, over months, very mysterious. Um, the, it took, it took uh, only until, well, until a few hundred years ago where uh, telescopes came. And it, in the, all, the, all these millennia, comets were uh, considered sort of messengers of, uh, uh, say, bad luck, good luck. This is the Bayeux Tapestry, for example. Uh, representing the Battle of Hastings in 1066, and you see up there in the right-hand side corner, you see the comet Halley represented there. Um, comets can actually bring bad luck. Uh, they, they have, in the past, hit the Earth. They will hit it again in the future and uh, leave scars like this. They can uh, create catastrophic events also at uh, global scale. So they have affected our history. They have affected the history of Earth, but also the history of life on Earth, probably. Um, when the era of telescopes came, ah, that's what is disturbing, right? this thing. When the era of telescopes came, uh, that's the way we could see comets. So not much, much more than what could be seen with the naked eye. Of course, you can do spectroscopy, you can do a lot of uh, measurements here, but eventually, what you see is still this very, very big tail of ions, of dusts, and uh, they, are, they are millions of kilometers long, but what is generating this tail is totally invisible. It's actually a very small uh, piece of rock uh, in the middle of, uh, well, in the center of, uh, of that very bright spot. Um, there's no way to see it from Earth. You can see, you can determine some characteristics from it by looking at the light curve for example, the rotation. You can estimate the mass, but uh, it's uh, very, very little you can tell uh, from uh, even with a very powerful telescope. You need spacecraft to see one, and uh, this was in the in uh, 86. In fact, uh, this, these pictures were taken by the ESA Giotto spacecraft, but there was a fleet of spacecraft, an international fleet of spacecraft that passed by the comet Halley, and for the first time they imaged a comet nucleus. This is about 15 kilometers long, 
And just to tell you how ignorant we were at that time about what a nucleus would look like, uh, the camera was programmed to look for something very bright. And in fact, we detected that the comet nuclei were extremely dark. I mean, this thing is extremely dark. It reflects maybe 5%, 6% of the sunlight. It's very, very black. Um, this was a flyby. So the spacecraft flew very, very fast, 60 kilometers per second, uh, in the proximity of the comet. It could take measurements, it could take pictures, but only for a couple of hours. Uh, there were more flybys in history. Uh, in fact, these are all NASA spacecraft that in uh, the last decade uh, did flybys of other comets. So more comet nucleus were, nuclei were imaged and measurements were made. But uh, with Rosetta, we wanted to do the next step, not just uh, flying and stay in the vicinity of the comet for a couple of hours, but go there and stay there, so do a rendezvous. So the real first novelty of Rosetta is a rendezvous. Um, the mission started on the 2nd of March 2004. It was a very short window. Did 10 years of travel. I'll go a bit more in detail about the, the orbit. Over 7 billion kilometers four gravity assists, two asteroid flybys, and it reached distances from the Sun of uh, 800 million kilometers and from the Earth a billion kilometers. Um, it was, in fact, uh, the first spacecraft with solar panels that reached these type of distances. Um, and you will see later that uh, we had to cope with that. The objective was a rendezvous with a comet, first time, and then the landing on the comet that you will hear more in detail from uh, uh, Stefan. Um, this is what we had uh, the, in terms of information about the nucleus. This is a picture taken of the comet 67P churyumov gerasimenko which was our target. Again, you don't see the nucleus here. Yeah? This is just an, a um, brightness scale. These were the photographic plates of when the comet was detected in 1968. We had a spacecraft that was built uh, in the land, second half of the 90s, beginning of the year 2000. Um, this is the spacecraft, the body of the spacecraft in the thermal vacuum. Not very exciting in terms of shape. It's just a big box, uh, three meters high, two meter, the basis. And here you see the lander feeling. There was uh, the, co -pass the passenger over Rosetta for this uh, very long trip until we came to the comet. Feele is... Uh, also the size of a big washing machine, about 100 kilo weight, and uh, a very complex uh, washing machine, of course. Um, on the side of the spacecraft, we had these very large solar panels. As I said before, we had to reach these enormous distances from the sun. That's all we could do. The biggest panel we could build was about 64 square meter, and uh, it gave us ener enough energy, but not enough to operate the spacecraft throughout. And that was an exciting part of the mission. We had, of course, a payload, and uh, here I'm not going too much in detail, but on board the orbiter we had imaging instruments in various wavelengths. We have gas and dust mass uh, spectroscopy instruments. We had uh, instruments to study the structure of the dust, because that's, that's one advantage of uh, going to a comet, that the comet throws a lot of material to you, so you can measure it uh, locally with your instruments, even if you are a few hundred kilometers away. We had plasma experiments. And then we have the lander, which I'm not going too much in detail because Stefan will tell you more. But the lander had also a, a large set of instruments to carry on the surface, imaging, gas, dust, and uh, plasma instruments, and uh, instruments for the analysis of the, of the surface and the subsurface, including a drill. And by the way, the two, um, the two vehicles not only communicated over a radio link, the lander could not communicate directly to the Earth. It, it had to transmit everything to Rosetta, and Rosetta transmit instructions to it, so to, use, to be used as a data relay. But they could also transmit radio waves to each other via scientific instruments that could be used for a tomography of the nucleus. So quite a complex uh, set of experiments we were flying. We had to build a ground segment. Uh, the operation center is in Darmstadt, uh, Germany, for uh, Rosetta. There is a lander control center in uh, Cologne, in, also in Germany. And we, when we launched, we had uh, only one deep space antenna for ESA, so we had a lot of help from our 
NASA colleagues of uh, DSN. Uh, but during the flight, we built two more. Uh, is a deep space antenna. These are 35 meter antenna in Sebreros in Spain and uh, in Argentina. So by the time we were there, we had also our network or antenna. But NASA continued to support us so that we could have a, a very large uh, coverage. We have also a science ground segment in, uh, in Spain where the planning of the scientific instruments is made. So finally, we came to the launch. This is a a video of the launch on the 2nd of March on Ariane 5. And you see, as you, as you are very familiar with this, there's a lot of energy involved in a launch like this. And Ariane 5 is one of the most powerful launches we can have. But uh, this was not enough in order to, to allow us to get to the comet with the right velocity. Doing a rendezvous with the comet means reaching it, but reaching it with the same orbital energy that the comet itself has. So, we had to do something that in interplanetary flight is quite common. We had to do gravity assists. You see the trajectory of Rosetta, the white one. One year after launch, we were back to Earth, and we got the first gravitational push from the Earth. So we could get, you see, we're on a wider orbit now. We had more energy. But this was just the start. So in February 2007, we flew by Mars. You see it here. And we used it to deviate our trajectory so that we would rapid, oops, uh, sorry. We would rapidly fall back to, now you have to see it again. We would rapidly fall back to Earth and do a second gravity assist. And this was uh, in, again in 2007. After the second gravity assist, we had enough energy to go further away from the sun and we crossed the asteroid belt. So we did a, a flyby of a small asteroid, also as a sort of test of our techniques, optical navigation, and also a test of our instrumentation. Um, so here we are back to the, to the Mars swim by. You see the trajectory deviated back to Earth, so this was the second Earth flyby. And then we crossed the asteroid belt here once. And two years later, we came back again to, to Earth. You see, the comet is passing by there, but we don't care at this stage. We don't have the right velocity, so we just let it pass the perihelion. So, third Earth flyby, and at this stage, we had enough energy to get out and reach the, the comet. But at this stage, we were getting to those very large distances, so we didn't have enough electrical energy to power all systems and keep the spacecraft Active. So when we came to 4.5 um, AU astronomical units, we had to hibernate the spacecraft. We spun it up and we switched it off for two and a half years. Finally, in January 2014, we could reactivate it and we were there. So just a couple of pictures to show that we have really done it. So this was a, a flyby of Mars. We flew at 250 kilometers altitude, so this was a very precise fly by, and we used Phile here. Phile, if you remember the other picture, was mounted on the back of the spacecraft, and uh, so on the dark side of the spacecraft. So he took a picture with a Phile camera uh, that where you can see the back of the solar arrays and you can see the surface of Mars. Today we would call this a selfie. This is an asteroid flyby, the second one, Lutetia. At that time was the biggest asteroid ever observed from a spacecraft, 130 kilometers in this size. And uh, also used for uh, uh, preparation of our comet phases. Then we came to the hibernation. Hibernation, as I mentioned before, this is the sun, this is the Earth orbit. We were out here, and we were very, very far. So we had to, perform, per, to run this arc here, two and a half years, uh, with less power that we needed to switch everything, to, to keep everything on. So spun up the spacecraft, switched off the transmitter, this is the last signal, the noise we received and the, and the peaks that the high-gain antenna was transmitting to Earth when strobing. These peaks told us that everything was fine and we had to switch it off. And you can imagine for operators switching off a spacecraft for two and a half years is not a nice thing. It's something that uh, we didn't like doing. We had to do it for this mission, but we would prefer not to repeat. So we came we put a, a, a timer on the spacecraft. In fact, there were redundant timers, of course. And we set it to switch on 
on the 20th of January 2014. There was a sequence of complex activities that the spacecraft had to perform before it could confirm that it was active and send a, a signal to us. Um, so we predicted that the signal would arrive between 18.30 and 19.30. And uh, so on that evening, this is a picture of uh, Andrea Comazzo, who was the flight director at the time of the final comet phases, and myself, initially relatively confident, at least Andrea was, uh, getting a little bit more worried uh, when the signal came to 1900. It was in the middle of the window, yeah? And still there was no signal there, so the, the clock was uh, running. Uh, towards, uh, <laughs> uh, say, 1915, that's, that's uh, the situation. We were really a bit concerned there. But eventually the signal came. This little peak was not only a signal that Rosetta was alive, but basically, in order to send us this uh, signal, Rosetta had to do so many things that we had, through this, a confirmation that 80% uh, of the platform was still very healthy and working fine. So you can imagine the joy in the control center. So this was the most important moment of the mission, even more than the landing, even more than anything else we've done. This was all or nothing. Yeah? So had we had lost this, uh, this signal, we would have not had any mission. OK, two more months, because we were very far away from the sun still, so it took us a long time to activate everything. And finally, our instruments on board were ready to take a picture of the comet. So this is the first picture we took of our target from Rosetta. And you can recognize, of course, the comet in that uh, center, in that uh, uh, green circle. I don't, yeah, but I was told that this is the comet. Yeah. Um, sh uh, still, a couple of months later, 28th of June, at this stage we were at 40,000 kilometers from the comet. Uh, Finally, we could resolve the nucleus, a few more pixels. And uh, I mean, these are pictures which are taken at a distance of uh, several hours. So you see this movement, but of course, it's very slow. We, people were very puzzled about uh, this uh, strange sequence of pictures. This, the, the nucleus didn't look very stable. And uh, one month later, 14th of July, that's what we could resolve. And this was a big surprise. Um, this very strange shape that today our scientists tell us is the result of a collision of two objects. At least that's the most uh, uh, accepted theory at the moment. Uh, rotating as predicted with a, a period of 12 hours, about 12 hours, so it's not that fast. But the shape was very, very complex. In fact, on this day, we, we were still not 100% sure that these were not two separate bodies. Yeah? Uh, fortunately, it turned out to be just one. So, Eventually, we arrived. Arrived means on the 6th of August, we stopped at 100 kilometers distance. Um, this was the start of the real difficult phase for us. We arrived at this object. We had no idea of its characteristics. So it's, you cannot just go there and go in orbit around it. We didn't even know the mass. We had to estimate that. So this is the period where our navigation people, our flight dynamics people, did really miracles. We stopped at 100 kilometers distance, we took some uh, nice pictures, like this one here. And since people say that we keep taking black and white pictures, we show you also a color picture, which is this one here. So, <laughs> so uh, as I said before, these comets are very dark, very, they're black. In fact, if we didn't stretch the contrast, you, you could hardly tell the difference between the black background and the comet itself. This is really Many shades of gray, I would say. Uh, to give you an idea of the dimensions, this uh, is a picture of the Mont Blanc that a colleague found on the internet, taken from 100 kilometers distance. And this is the comparison of uh, the comet size with the Mont Blanc. Or if you put it over London, that's more or less what it would look like. So it is big, but it's still a very, very small thing in, uh, in space. So it has a very, very tiny influence on our orbit, and we had to measure, measure that. Our flight dynamics people invented these triangular orbits at 100 kilometers distance in front of the comet. By measuring the bending of the trajectory caused by the gravity of the comet, which is very tiny, um, they could determine pretty well the mass. So first a triangle at 100 kilometers, it took a couple of weeks, 
then a triangle at 50 kilometers, and then finally we could go into, into bound orbits. Um, you see, this is the transition. I think here we were end of uh, August, be beginning of September. And that's when we enter into a circular orbit at 30 kilometers distance. And the, the nice thing of a tiny gravity is that you can do things like this. You change the inclination like that. Yeah? Forget about that around the planet. Yeah? But OK, so um, this phase was used to characterize the comet. It was not only the gravity or the mass, but we had also to model all the other forces which act on the space cab in order to be able to navigate. So model the effect of the dust, of the gas uh, pressure around. All these forces are of the same order of magnitude, more or less, of the radiation pressure of the sun. So you can imagine. So one more com complication was that with radio measurements, we know very well, we knew very well where Rosetta was, but the comet itself doesn't have a transponder on board. So what counts in the accuracy is the, is the relative position and velocity between Rosetta and the comet. And in order to improve that, we had to use optical navigation. So our uh, flight dynamics people built a digital model, identified landmarks, compared successive pictures, and doing, doing triangulations, they could, they could do the navigation around it. Um, Today, this is also done automatically because there are, uh, well, software, they've developed software that recognizes these landmarks and extracts basically all the relevant parameters out of successive pictures. So this was the, certainly the most exciting phase. We had to do everything very fast uh, because these guys wanted to land in November. So, by the way, this is the first mission in history of space flight that selects its landing site by itself. All the previous ones had precursor missions. We didn't have them. So we had uh, to land these guys, and we didn't have very much time. OK, thanks, Paolo. <laughs> OK, so good afternoon, everybody. I will now tell you the second part of the story and everything about the lander how it landed several times and where it is right now uh, and uh, what we believe we can still do with the lander. But maybe let, let me start with the core questions to be addressed with lander science. Rosetta as such was first of all, of course, chosen as a mission to rendezvous with a comet to investigate it from some distance uh, with remote sensing instrumentation, um, with also in situ instrumentation to investigate the dust environment and uh, uh, the gas environment. Uh, but we wanted to go even one step further, to, to go to the object of desire to go to this pristine material in the solar system by actually uh, touching it and then to have a ground reference uh, which would allow us to, to understand better the models of a differentiation or modification of gas, of composition, of dust, which then can be measured, it still is measured uh, these days, uh, with Rosetta in a few uh, kilometers or a few ten kilometers distance. In addition, of course, if you want to understand the physical properties of a cometary body of the nucleus, you really have to go there. You have to feel it, to touch it, uh, to interact with the surface. In addition to these uh, scientific objectives, there was a number of technical uh, challenges with such a, um, a lander. Uh, of course, it was the first landing on a comet, uh, which would have been challenging by itself. Uh, but one particularity of this mission was that when we designed FILA, when we designed the overall Rosetta mission, we had almost no idea on our target body, besides the fact that the original target was even another comet, Comet Virtanen. Uh, we had no idea uh, what the surface would look like. We had a vague idea um, on the size, on the rotation period from ground uh, observations and light curves, but no idea how really such a surface would look. In addition, now going more in particular to the lander, uh, it was of course also a, a challenge in miniaturization to have a whole uh, laboratory with 10 scientific instruments um, on a 100 kilogram what did you say, washing machine sized 
Some people refer to washing machines and to fridge, I don't know uh, the size of your washing machine. On a fairly small body, you can see it uh, in the exhibition, a one-to-one -one model of this. Another challenge was to go far away from the sun, to land on a planetary body without any uh, nuclear heating. Um, and, uh, well, the miniaturization in the lab with the 10 instruments I mentioned already. Now, just a few images uh, to show you, uh, well, the lander and uh, how it looked. This is an image taken during qualification uh, in a vacuum chamber. This is the flight uh, model during a, a vacuum test. And this is another um, image where you see the lander attached to the overall Rosetta uh, spacecraft in the Estec vacuum chamber. So Estec is in Holland, that's why we call this guy usually the flying Dutchman who is uh, working in there and removing red tag items before uh, the chamber is closed. You've seen a, a similar thing already in, in uh, Paolo's presentation, that's the trajectory of Rosetta. Uh, but just to give you a little bit of feeling of the, of the scale, so November 12th, uh, this is at 3 AU, uh, the distance when the lander has been delivered, uh, uh, quite far away from the sun, because this was, of course, the period when the comet was not very active yet, when Rosetta could get close to the nucleus and it was relatively safe, um, as we believed, to land. Uh, August. That's a typo 13th, it should say, uh, was the, uh, uh, the perihelion, the closest point to the sun, and October 13th is about the position where we are now. Now, how did we think one should land uh, on a comet? Uh, Rosetta cannot hover. Rosetta is always in an orbit or in a quasi-orbit, some kind of a, a hyperbolic um, trajectory around the comet. Uh, so the, the lander had to be ejected somehow to reduce this orbital velocity to make it fall to the surface. And the word falling is correct because it was basically gravitationally driven. The gravity is low of a comet, but still uh, there is gravity that brought the uh, lander uh, down to the surface. And after this eject, the lander was internally uh, stabilized by a flywheel. Um, we expected that at touchdown, uh, a cold gas system, a thruster, would press the lander to the surface to avoid any rebounds, and two harpoons, anchoring harpoons, would be fired to fix the lander to the surface, again, to avoid rebounds, but also to avoid more uh, mechanical activation on the surface of the comet, like, for instance, drilling. Now, as I assume most of you uh, know uh, this Colchis system and the Hapons did not work and the lander indeed did uh, bounce fortunately uh, to a place where it came to rest and where we could do uh, the measurements. Now this is just a short movie and I'm not showing you the whole... Oops. No? What's that? Let's go back. No, I'm not going to show you this movie. Not there. Why isn't it working? It was working before. Well, what you would have seen was the lander separation with the correct velocity, which was low, something like 18 centimeters per second, um, in an altitude of, it was exactly 22 kilometers at the end. Uh, landing gear was deployed 20 meters, 20 minutes uh, later, the lander descended. Uh, seven hours, so NASA had these seven minutes of terror. We did 60 times better if it comes to terror. Seven hours um, later, touchdown at the surface. You've seen this image before. Uh, just to give you an impression, when we uh, started this mission, uh, also when we prepared the landing for almost 10 years of cruise, we were always assuming the comet to be some kind of a roundish, potato-shaped body. And then, only in July, we found out it looks very bizarre. Many people refer to it as a, as a rubber ducky, so with, yeah, indeed, it looks a little bit like this. And of course, we, we had to think about, is it possible? How do you land on a rubber ducky? Is it still possible? Yes, of course, you can find dynamics, but you are also restricted in the areas where you can land. For instance, in the neck, it would have been difficult or impossible to land. Yeah? 
Uh, this is another um, image, uh, another selfie, if you wish, uh, where you see again the backside of Rosetta uh, solar panel uh, and in the background already uh, the comet, which is not just with a funny shape. Uh, it is also a very, very rough terrain on the surface of this comet, uh, which again challenged the selection of a landing site. And although we had 10 years of cruise and we could prepare in theory and academically many scenarios, it was only this very short period of time between August till November when the actual landing took place that we could select a landing site and work out the delivery strategy, um, delivery strategy, of course, mainly from the Rosetta side, the delivery orbit, but also from the lander side, the whole time sequence, how to do this. Now, the landing site was selected with a number of criteria, um, obviously also scientific ones, but uh, frankly speaking, there was no uh, spot on this comet which would have been considered scientifically boring. Um, so at the end, it was mainly technical requirements, like the illumination, Obviously, you want to land on the uh, summer hemisphere and not on a very dark place, uh, but also arguments like uh, trajectory, uh, duration of the descent, uh, surface roughness, boulder statistics, these kind of things. Um, we had a, a radar instrument on board, uh, a concert which needed a certain geometry between lander and orbiter, and also this went into the constraints. So, after uh, going into all of this, I would assume this doesn't work either. Uh, very strange, it doesn't work. Um, we selected first 10, then 5, then 2 uh, potential landing sites. Uh, one has to know the landing ellipse, so the uncertainty we had to assume where the lander could touch down was in the range of one square kilometer. And there was no area on the whole comet where one square kilometer was really safe. So for these potential landing sites, we did all kinds of um, statistics, slope statistics, boulder statistics, uh, and you see one of those uh, here. This is for the site which was eventually chosen, uh, originally called J and then uh, named Akilkia. Um, and you see there is some areas in red and yellow uh, which refer to these areas with very high slope. So if the lander would have touched down here in these red areas, most probably it would have capsized and we would have never uh, gotten any, any signal um, again. And this was the best site. So you, saw, you see, yeah, it looks quite good, but it's nowhere close to 99 or 95 uh, percent uh, confidence in a safe landing. So this is the next movie I'm not going to show you. Uh, no, it's a pity. Um, anyway, but, but what you would see again on this is the separation from the orbiter, and then it's, um, as I said, from 22 kilometers, seven hours uh, descent. The comet was, of course, rotating in this time, uh, rotation period, as Paolo said, 12 hours, and then we would uh, really touch down at the uh, exact landing site. Now, what happened around landing? We did all kinds of uh, landing preparation. Lander was heated up. Uh, central computer was uh, booted. And this time, when it was really about to land, we faced all kinds of problems. We had a problem with the CDMS. Uh, we were really worried. Things were strange a little bit. We also, in this preparation work, found out that this the Colchis system I was mentioning before most probably would not work because it's a Colchis system with a nitrogen tank uh, which we didn't manage to open. Uh, but after some analysis, we found out postponing this landing wouldn't have really helped. So uh, we decided to give the go, uh, do the separation um, and go for the landing. Separation itself went perfect. The separation uh, mechanism worked perfect, very exact uh, uh, ejection velocity. Uh, the injection of the overall uh, spacecraft was just perfect. Um, and uh, the real touchdown also was on the point at 15.34.04 uh, UTC, just a few 10 seconds um, away from the targeted uh, time. So, you, of course, it takes some minutes or tens of minutes to really analyze housekeeping data. But you have to imagine there is a whole world, camera teams looking at you, 
Did you land? When did you land? Did you already land? Are we there yet? You know? uh, so we somehow internally agreed, if we get the touchdown signal and we still receive data from the lander, that's a good sign because it means the lander did not capsize. I told you this was the main concern we had. Um, and we can really um, start to uh, start our science sequence and our measurements. And this occurred at 15. 34, uh, the lander has touched down, we received the signal, we still got strong radio contact, so we could announce uh, Fila has landed, uh, everything seems to be good, so the party started, the champagne was opened, uh, but a few minutes later we noticed, well, maybe it's not so good, something is strange, Fila is still in movement, and indeed, it was uh, bouncing off. Uh, just before I come to this bouncing and to the, the uh, uh, well, the search of the lander, if you wish, uh, some pictures here, which, uh, well, I personally see them a bit emotional. You have this baby, 10 years developed, 10 years in cruise, and then you see with the orbiter camera, with the Osiris camera, how the lander uh, goes to the uh, nucleus of the comet, and that's a kind of double scope, if you wish, uh, image how to go there. Uh, this is the touchdown site, uh, the first touchdown site. Uh, you see very close to the targeted area, uh, and the picture you see in the frame in here uh, has been taken with the camera looking down uh, from the lander. That's why we knew also very accurately uh, where we have been. Uh, this is another image, interesting, taken with the navigation camera from the orbiter, and you see here the shadow of some material which has been uh, excavated by the touchdown, and even in, in one of these frames, uh, although only a, a few pixels in size, uh, the lander uh, and, and its shadow indicating that the lander was moving away. And there's a sequence of images, some of you may have seen this, uh, and again, uh, taken from the orbiter camera, you see the lander here as it is descending to the surface, you always have to time in there, and this frame, there is one picture before the touchdown and one later. So we could really see the imprints of the lander right there. And on this frame, where you see the imprints, if you look very careful, you see the little guy right here. This is Fila bouncing off. In this image, together with other information, other images, other instrument data, then was used uh, to reconstruct the trajectory of the hopping, of the bouncing, and to find out where the lander is. Same image. Uh, again, with a bit higher resolution. This is now, uh, as I said, the reconstruction. Uh, so you see the, uh, it, it looks a bit bended because of course the comet was rotating. The touchdown first, everything would have been perfect to some extent, and then the lander bounced off. Uh, there is a damping mechanism in the landing gear which worked fairly well, uh, which reduced uh, most of the vertical impact energy, so this worked well, uh, but the lateral velocity was not damped, so we made a jump about one kilometer, quite far, slow velocity though, some 30 centimeter per second, uh, hit the crater rim and then ended up somewhere here on the dark side. Fortunately, not completely dark, and fortunately, we still had uh, radio contact. Some analysis um, of these um, imprints, uh, you may believe these are the three feet, that's not true. The lander in size is about this, so it's more complicated than that. Uh, most probably the whole uh, crater here was excavated by one touchdown, and the lander lifted up, plowed with one leg, uh, causing this second thing, and this is, is pretty flat, so that's probably just excavated material, and we did some analysis on the depth um, of these uh, yeah, footprints. Uh, indicating uh, that there most probably is a layer of dust of regolith about 20 centimeters above uh, hard material, uh, icy, porous icy material. Uh, the lander has acoustic sensors in the feet, instrument Kasse, part of Sesam, where we could hear the touchdown. So that's really the crack of one foot, and this is the first touch of the surface. Then the foot penetrates these about 20 centimeters and hits the hard material. This you can uh, analyze by, by listening to the feet. Now, where is the lander now? Uh, another uh, image from the orbiter. 
this is about the area. It, in the meantime, we, we know by about 20 to 30 meter the area uh, by, by radio sounding, mainly with the concert, with the radar um, instrument. Uh, so we know quite well where the lander is. However, so far it has not been identified on any of the OSIRIS images. This will be one of the exciting things uh, we hope to uh, be able to do it towards the end of the mission when Rosetta can go to very low orbits to get high resolution images of the uh, lander itself where it is right now. There's an image by the panoramic camera, Shiva, at the final uh, landing site. Uh, so you see this, this material here, which looks like rock. It's not rock. It's icy material with a lot of organic stuff in there, uh, with cracks, uh, with here a bit like, like conglomerate. It resembles re uh, conglomerate, but, but just to tell you, yeah, this is the oldest material in the solar system. This material here is some 4.6 billion years old. This material here is the foot of the lander is some 20 years old. Another image uh, from uh, Shiva, um, as I'm going to explain it in a bit more, more detail, that the final landing site is very dark, very little illumination. Um, so this is a, a picture where the, the illumination was stretched, CCD camera reflected from the lander, and you see this cliff-like uh, structure uh, where the lander is. Immediately after uh, touchdown, we went into an improvised first scientific sequence. What we've planned originally would have very early gone to drilling, sampling, activating mechanisms. Since we knew we were not anchored, um, we changed this and did first of all measurements which would not endanger the lander from capsizing uh, due to some unstable position. Uh, but at the end of the sequence, and I'm not going through all of these, all 10 lander instruments could have been activated at least once, uh, most of them really getting exciting scientific data uh, in uh, this first science sequence, which was mainly uh, powered by the primary battery, uh, lasting about 64 hours after separation. Uh, so we got a plentitude of data. Uh, there has been a special issue of science where most of these early results from November uh, have been put together. Uh, just to summarize a few of them for you, obviously we have the, the images. Uh, we see the fine structure down to a sub-millimeter resolution, the surface material um, of, the, of the comet material. We did measurements on the surface strength. Uh, by an instrument called MUPUS, which attempted to hammer into ground. Also by the bouncing dynamics itself, was very surprising. Comet material seems to be very hard, not this very soft uh, stuff that many people were uh, assuming we would find there. Uh, many people were afraid we would sink many meters into the surface. It's completely different. We found organic compounds, there were two evolved cast analyzers on board, COSAC and Ptolemy, uh, identifying uh, organic components, also prebiotic uh, components, interesting now to embed into our theories of the understanding of how life may have formed on Earth. Uh, we, had a ma well, we have a magnetometer on board indicating that the comet is non-magnetic. That's not so trivial as you may think. Obviously, there is no uh, dynamo, uh, but if there would have been a, a, a protosolar magnetic field in the, in the early solar system, uh, magnetic components, magnetic grains uh, would have led to some kind of a magnetic field on the surface. And we've measured the internal structure with the concert instrument. So, um, I just picked three instruments. I cannot go through all of these two to show you. Uh, this is from Rollis, the down-looking camera, kind of a movie. Lander gets closer and closer. The lowest um, image we have is from some nine meters distance with a, a resolution uh, of better than one uh, centimeter. Uh, I mentioned the organic compounds. You see here the list of uh, molecules that could be identified with COSAC, with the mass spectrometer. Uh, we could not sample, uh, but some of the dust, some of the material went into the instrument due to the first touchdown, and we got this very exciting uh, list of alcohols, of uh, ketones, um, of organic uh, components, just that the formulas are just examples. That's the list of um, identified molecules right there, what we, what we found. Ptolemy, uh, the other evolved gas analyzer, found indication for 
polymers, so also very, very exciting. And I mentioned the radar instrument, really scanning through uh, the nucleus while the nucleus was, was moving, sending uh, radio waves between uh, lander and, and orbiter, uh, indicating that the internal structure is quite homogeneous, but very porous uh, stuff um, by measuring uh, basically, of course, the dielectric constant, it's, it's, a, it's a radar instrument. Is the mission over? Uh, of course not. Uh, of course, and I will hand over to Paolo in a, in a second again, Rosetta is still at the comet. We still get very exciting uh, signs from there. Uh, but also, um, Phile, the lander itself, we still have some hope uh, to get data again. So when, when uh, the first sign sequence was over in November, uh, we knew we are in a place where there is just about one hour, 20 per comet day illumination. The lander would fall into kind of a hibernation, there is not enough sunlight uh, to operate it at this distance to the sun. Uh, but we were hoping that if we get closer and closer to the sun, the lander would wake up again and start talking uh, to Rosetta. And indeed, this happened on June uh, 13th. We got the signal, we got several more contacts in the meantime. However, unfortunately, we never got a stable link, we never got reliable links. Uh, so the last signal we had was from July 9th, um, again sending housekeeping data uh, of the lander, but we were not able uh, to command individual science sequences. Now in August and September, due to the high activity of the comet, Rosetta had to go further away from the comet, too far uh, to allow communications with the lander. This shall change in November, when the comet is less active again, but still close enough uh, to the sun to allow, hopefully, uh, lander communication, so there is still a chance to talk to the lander. That's a model um, of uh, using the camera images of how the lander is positioned in this kind of a cavity in there, uh, which reduces the illumination. And this is a view graph which shows you uh, when we had, uh, as I said, 13th of June the 1st, July uh, 9th the last, where we had uh, contact with the lander, and the red curve is the heliocentric distance. We are around here now, and you see in November uh, we are still in an area where we had on the uh, way towards the sun, we did have contact. So November, maybe even December, there is a fair chance uh, to still uh, get signals from the lander. So Phila has provided us a wealth of scientific information from the comet during its first scientific sequence. We've been optimistic that we even have a chance to get more signal, more science uh, in a long-term science period in summer. Widely enough, we were right. Lander was very cold in the meantime, uh, but it woke up again. Now we have to hope uh, that we get more science and more um, stable links to really command it. In the meantime, we should enjoy uh, data which come every day from Rosetta, and I hand over again to Paolo to show you some uh, pictures and data from uh, Rosetta Mothership. Thank you, Steve. So, just to complete, we finally got rid of the lander. Yeah, we felt so light, under kilos on the back for 10 years, and finally we could do the rest of the job, which was, as you remember, Rosetta has a lot of experiments on board and started doing the orbiter science, uh, while we're waiting for Phile to wake up again. We took these uh, fantastic panorama pictures, shame about this dot here. Um, this was taken from six kilometers altitude back in February, where, where we could still get relatively close to the comet. Uh, or you see these incredible scenarios here. This is a high meter high, uh, sorry, 100 meter high peak on the, on the comet. Um, of course, there's a lot of science that you can do with these uh, surface pictures. Uh, the comet helps us also to see what is inside the surface. You see, through these uh, uh, holes that appear on the surface, probably due to explosions of these geysers uh, when it emits gas and, and dust, you see the inner structure of the comets with these uh, goose bumps that, you, that the scientists are not yet able to explain. Uh, it's throwing dust to us, so our instruments can measure at uh, microscopic scales the structure of the, of, the, of the dust, but also the composition. 
uh, we can measure the plasma, the interaction of the environment of the comet with the solar wind. Uh, of course, uh, isotopic composition of the, of the elements that come to us. So Rosetta keeps producing an enormous amount of uh, data, which are downlinked every day. Uh, the comet is getting very active. So we had to go away, back off a few hundred kilometers from the surface. This is also why we cannot uh, anymore in this phase attempt contacts with Philae. Uh, but still from these distances, we observe this uh, incredible growth of the activity. The comet reached the uh, perihelion uh, mid-August, but it's still very active now. It's just uh, slowly cooling down while we're far away. And uh, we started having also problems because Rosetta has uh, these things called star trackers mounted on one side. They are essential to um, maintain the attitude of the spacecraft. They have to see the stars. And uh, in that cloud of dust we are flying in, sometimes what they see is this. And uh, it's, they have a very clever software that can distinguish the stars from the grains of dust. But when the grains are too many, uh, the software doesn't work anymore. So we had to go into phases where, into places where the dust density is lower and the illumination uh, of the dust is worse so that we can see the stars. Um, the comet is also not only increasing the activity, but is also having explosions on the surface. You see these, these pictures are taken at a few hours distance. There is the constant activity and then suddenly these bursts, which you can see on these three pictures here taken at uh, 18 minutes from each other. This is the same picture, just with different contrast. And look at this, 18, 18 minutes before there was nothing here, 18 minutes after just a little bit of emission. And look at this enormous uh, jet. This was detected, Rosetta at that time was, I don't remember, 200, 250 kilometers. And we could see uh, the effects on the environment of this, of this jet. Um, so, still a lot of work to do. What's happen what happens next? Uh, at the moment, uh, we've been for a couple of weeks doing what we call an excursion in the coma, in the tail of the, of the comet for about 1,500 kilometers, especially our uh, plasma instruments. The, the scientists were interested to see the structure of the interaction of the coma at different distances with the solar system. Uh, we are coming back. We will stop at uh, about 400 kilometers, which is still the distance that we consider safe, so at which we can still see the stars through our star trackers. Uh, but now that the activity is gradually decreasing, we will try in the coming weeks to get closer and closer. So we will we'll reduce the distance on the surface gradually. And we hope that maybe by, by the end of the year or early next year, we can return to the closed circular orbits, maybe 30 kilometers or so, so that we can observe also from closer distance the changes to the surface after this uh, um, high activity season and of course can attempt again uh, to get in contact with, uh, with Philae. Finally, end of September, uh, it's a date, the good time to terminate the mission. What happens, as you remember, we are now on the same orbit as the comet from the Sun, so we are now getting back into distances where the spacecraft cannot be active anymore. We would have to hibernate it again. And this time we would have to hibernate it over a longer arc at larger distances uh, for several years, the fuel is uh, getting short, so it's not really worthwhile to do this. So we think at that time we will switch off the space car, but we will not just simply switch it off. We will do it in a spectacular way. Our scientists want us to, in the, in the last few weeks, in September, between August and September, to get closer and closer to the surface, taking more and more risks until either we lose control or if we come to the end of September, we may do a controlled touchdown. Uh, so that will be the end of the mission, and we are approaching the end of the presentation. I point here a few uh, uh, websites where you, you can follow the mission. I like very much the blog. Uh, you, you can learn a lot on these things. It's kept up to date. I want to acknowledge the team. These are pictures taken from ISOC, but of course there's a lot of people working in Cologne. There's a lot of people working in many places, including the uh, universities and all the people that are using this data. These are the people that made this mission and I want to acknowledge that. Uh, uh, myself, I have, I'm now belong to the category that goes around and tells the story. They are still there working today. Um, and that's, 
the final selfie that you saw also before is greetings from the comet from Rosetta. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Machst du die Fragen? No. I didn't promise you too much. This is really an exciting mission, and as we just heard, it also will have a spectacular end by September next year, and you will all hear about this uh, probably on the next IEC in Guadalajara. Uh, there's still um, some time for questions. Um, yes, we get some. Oh, that's quite a lot. <laughs> Please, can we start here? Do we have a microphone somewhere? Hi, Joav Lanzmann from uh, Space IL. Um, first of all, thank you for a very inspiring mission. Um, my question is, uh, do you have enough data about what happened, uh, what went wrong with the gas thruster and the harpoons of the Philae lander? Yeah. Okay. Uh, to, well, I have, think it worked. Um, for the gas thruster, um, which is uh, connected to a nitrogen, a gas nitrogen tank, um, we failed to open an initial valve. So in order to make sure that the gas stays contained over the 10 years of cruise, there was a membrane, and the membrane should have been penetrated and opened um, two days prior to the landing, and we failed to do this, uh, although we re-attempted it. Um, for the harpoon, it's not so clear. After a careful failure analysis, we are still at two possibilities what could have been uh, the reason. One is that the pyro itself did not fire, means that the, uh, the nitrocellulose in the pyro, uh, due to the 10 years in space, degraded in a way uh, that the filaments, which were supposed to ignite them, burned through before the granules reached the ignition temperature. It's a possibility. The other possibility, and it's very difficult to find out which one is true, is that the final element of the pyro electro electronics, which powers the filaments, had a failure and the filaments have never been powered. Uh, what we know for sure is it has not been fired and the harpoons were not uh, leaving this kind of cannon uh, structure. The uh, device itself uh, reacted, it noticed the touchdown and even the rewind and motor tried to rewind, but there was not much to rewind because the harpoons were not fired. Yes, please. Brent Sherwood, JPL. Congratulations on a fantastic mission. Um, if we combine the data for the very high bulk porosity with the data for the uh, high surface strength, can you give us an example of a material that we're familiar with on Earth that would be anything like that? Okay. Uh, before the landing, we were afraid of extremely, extremely soft material, like uh, dust bunnies under your bed if you didn't vacuum properly, a huh? very soft material. Uh, and uh, indeed, we were a bit scared about sinking into this kind of material. And also the bigger dust grains you see, you've, you've seen the pictures on the, on the Star Tracker, there is other similar looking ones with the science cameras. Uh, big dust grains, they're not grains, this is this fluffy material. Uh, but what we really encountered uh, then was hard material. And hard means hard like sintered snow. So it's, it's not solidized, it would be even harder, uh, but simp snow, which it melts a little bit and then it refreezes and gets very hard and it has also minerals, uh, dust grains typically on, on, on Earth in it. So if you wanted to press your finger in, you probably could not enter. It's, it, it's relatively hard material and this was surprising. The dust layer on top is, is soft, it's softer than, let's say, dust or sand on Earth due to the low gravity. So this is still weak material. 
one more question here. Yeah. Um, Volker Neubert, uh, DLR. Thank you for this great mission. Um, my question is, how can you or can you determine if the scientific results that you receive from this mission is of general nature of comets or is it very unique for this comet? <laughs> you want to answer? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it, it's a bit difficult to make statistics with one. Obviously, it's only this comet which has been analyzed in this far detail. Uh, if we combine what we've learned about Churyumov with what we've learned with other comets before, uh, be it in Halle or in more detail, Wild and Tempo from the NASA missions, uh, Stardust and, and Deep Impact, uh, we learned that comets indeed look different one to each other. Uh, nevertheless, we believe that all of them are leftovers from the time of the formation of the solar system. So all comets somehow contain the pristine material from some four and a half billion years ago. And there it's, I think, allowed to generalize and to, to interpret the material we find in Juryomov um, as a, a typical content which you may find in comets. Uh, there is other examples, if you go, for instance, into the measurements uh, we did with the Rosina instrument on, on Rosetta of the D to H uh, ratio in the water, in the gas, uh, which is, for, in case of Churyumov, clearly different to ocean water on Earth. However, there is measurements, with less accuracy though, from other comets which indicate that some comets may have a more similar uh, water D to H uh, ratio as on the Earth. Uh, so, it's the only comet we've analyzed in this detail. You can obviously not make any statistics with one data point. Some generalization uh, is possible to have more cometary missions and learn more about these bodies certainly would be better to understand the global picture on what are comets, where do they come from, uh, are there differences, what's the statistics in composition and in, in structure. Okay, one last question. Uh, Daniel de Chambure from uh, ESA, so I'm a colleague of Paolo. Have you progressed on uh, the formation of the comet? Uh, this uh, strange shape, is it two different bodies or is it one? Have you any conclusion on that? Uh, yeah. The, the question was whether we have a better understanding now whether it's a binary contact, so whether it's really two bodies which somehow touched each other with non-destructively, uh, or whether it is a, a feature by the comet itself that this kind of neck structure, this deep valley, uh, is, is due to thermal effects and then uh, goes in. Now, there, there has been a paper in Nature recently uh, finding clear arguments for the first uh, scenario I was, was mentioning. So there is strong indication right now that it indeed is a binary contact. So it's two comets that somehow kissed themselves in their history and, and formed this uh, yeah, comet as we see it right now. So with the kissing comments, uh, we conclude this session. I would like to thank again uh, Paolo and uh, Stefan. You really heard our first-hand information. Thank you very much.